The Treasurer gives short shrift to the latest attempts at putting negative gearing back on the political agenda. Recriminations and reprisals over the death of a six-year-old Palestinian girl who pleaded to be rescued. WA beekeepers enjoying a bumper harvest, but the varroa mite threat looms large. And WA's Mitch Wisnowski prepares to punt in his second Super Bowl and cement his place in sporting history. Good evening, Brianna Shepherd with ABC News. The Treasurer is adamant the government isn't considering changes to negative gearing as pressure mounts to do more to address housing affordability. The Greens are proposing limiting negative gearing to a single investment property, but Jim Chalmers insists the only tax reform being considered are changes to the Stage 3 cuts. Despite the government's denials, the opposition claims it's giving every indication of revisiting its 2016 election promise to limit negative gearing. Lovely to have you in Ballarat. Very good Out of Canberra, but unable to escape questions on tax. What we're doing is putting in place a tax cut for every Australian worker. The government continuing to defend its changes to the Stage 3 tax cuts as the Coalition... Angus Taylor, welcome to the program. ...shifts gears. We won't support changes to negative gearing. That's their intent. Uh, we know they're considering this. Their answers in the Parliament on this <coughs> this week were very wishy-washy. That's not something that we're proposing, not something that we are considering, uh, not something that we are working up. Negative gearing allows landlords who lose money by paying out more in interest and maintenance than they're receiving in rent to offset that loss and reduce the tax they pay. Now is the time for reform on negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount because we are in a housing crisis. It's not just tax but the right to disconnect that will continue to be a talking point in Parliament this week. The opposition says if it wins the next election it will repeal legislation that passed the Senate just days ago, giving workers the right to ignore calls and emails when they're not on the clock without being penalised. But it's another out-of-hours issue that's stolen the limelight. This video, published by the Daily Mail, shows Nationals MP Barnaby Joyce after falling off a planter box while on the phone. It is up to um, uh, Barnaby Joyce to explain the circumstances around this. People love to jump to conclusions on these things and I'm certainly not doing that and I, I don't think anyone should. Mr Joyce says he's very embarrassed. He'll be meeting with his coalition leaders this week. Evelyn Manfield, ABC News, Canberra. Israeli forces claim to have new evidence linking the main UN aid agency in Gaza with Hamas. Troops have revealed a tunnel network running partly under the agency's headquarters, but the UN says the building's been unstaffed for months. It comes as new details emerge over a missing six-year-old Palestinian girl whose body has now been found. Heartbreaking horror in Gaza. The body of a six-year-old Palestinian girl is found in a bullet-ridden car, trapped and surrounded by her dead relatives. Hend Rajab pleaded with rescuers in a telephone call for three hours to be saved. <laughs> Two paramedics were sent, but they wouldn't reach her. The Palestinian Red Crescent has accused Israeli forces of killing them. Hen's mother had been waiting for news, holding her notebook where she'd been practising her handwriting. For every person who heard my voice, my daughter's pleading voice, yet did not rescue her, I will question them before God on the Day of Judgment. The Israeli military says it's discovered tunnels underneath the main headquarters of the UN aid agency UNRWA in Gaza City, saying it's found new evidence Hamas exploits the UN. This place is the, the Hamas, one of the Hamas's intelligence units where they command most of the combat from here, but from the underground. <laughs> UNRWA says it left the building on October 12 and denies knowledge of Hamas activity. 
Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has suggested the next phase of his invasion will be in the southern city of Rafa, the so-called safe zone where more than a million Palestinians have already fled to. Israel says it's preparing an evacuation plan, but there's virtually nowhere left for these Gazans to go. Also waiting for the news of their loved ones, desperate families of hostages taken by Hamas. They're demanding the Israeli government strike a deal now and quickly to bring them home. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. It's been 60 years since Australia's worst peacetime disaster, the sinking of HMAS Voyager, which killed 82 soul sailors. The destroyer sunk after a collision with aircraft carrier HMAS Melbourne during a training exercise off the New South Wales coast. At an event to mark the anniversary, the Navy has apologised for failing those who were left behind. Under the stars at Jervis Bay, emotions flow, remembering the 82 sailors who died during the nation's worst peacetime naval disaster. For those who survived the Voyager tragedy, the same question remains. One of the worst questions I've ever asked myself, uh, why did I get out? Gary Perrin and Duncan Fletcher were teenagers on board HMAS Voyager when the ship collided with HMAS Melbourne and sunk during nighttime training exercises off Jervis Bay. I looked up and I seen the flight deck of the uh, carrier coming over the top of us and then the screeching of the metal as she, she cut through. We were finally got out of the mess deck and up onto the quarter deck we found out that we didn't have a forward section and we'd been cut in half. As the decades passed, the Navy has had time to reflect on how it failed its people after the event. Our Navy was not great at dealing with the mental health scars that you accumulated on that fateful, tragic evening. We never got any help when it first happened. And um, I think that was a mistake. To those who were not well supported, I apologise. Our Navy should have done better. Families of victims and survivors say they'll continue to gather each year at Jervis Bay. I'm getting on now. I don't have long to go. But I will always remember my shipmates from Voyager. Romy Gilbert, ABC News. More than 30 people are recovering from carbon monoxide poisoning after attending a national women's hockey game at Adelaide's Ice Arena. Members of the public and players from the Victorian and South Australian teams were taken to hospital when they began feeling unwell following the game. Adelaide's iconic ice arena in the hands of firefighters. Crews were called to the Theberton business about half past three this morning after a group of people who had been to the Adelaide Rush and Melbourne ice match the night before took themselves to an emergency department with suspected carbon monoxide poisoning. Apparently they said they had a headache during the game or something. Um, and there were like six ice resurfaces at that time later in the day. The business was closed and ventilated to bring down high levels of the toxic gas, halting another game and children's birthday parties. It's believed the arena's ice resurfacer, which runs on liquefied petroleum gas, was responsible for the leak. They pinpointed it to what they think is the Zamboni and the exhaust of the Zamboni, so which operates on LPG gas. The most important thing is, is that the people that we've seen attending hospital have had relatively low levels, so it must mean that the exposure was uh, relatively low as well. Those who got treatment were aged from late teens to early 40s. Many were soon discharged from hospital and all are expected to make a full recovery. So far, everybody that I've contacted seem OK, so... I just hope everybody is OK. Health authorities say the building is still being monitored. The Metropolitan Fire Service will keep a, a check on the levels that they have gone down, but will keep checking um, and make sure that when the arena opens, it will be absolutely safe for the public. The arena is expected to reopen tomorrow. Imogen Hain, ABC News. 
The Whiteman Park Heritage Tram Line is being extended to the park's new Metronet train station, expected to open later this year. The electric tram line will be constructed out of 85% donated recycled materials, with the state government contributing $1 million to the project. The Transport Minister says she won't consider larger light rail projects until Metronet is complete. We've got a big task to finish Metronet projects and that's what we're focusing on now. Um, again, I don't like to deal with hypotheticals. We've got these incredible projects that we're rolling out and my job is to see these finished. Pakistan has been plunged into even deeper political turmoil with allegations of vote rigging and uncertainty over which party can form government. Despite a military crackdown, the party of jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan has claimed the most seats, but his supporters fear they may be barred from forming a coalition. Anger outside Pakistan's election commission in Karachi. Supporters of Imran Khan's PTI party say they fear their election wins are being snatched away. We will fight for our rights as we have done in the past. We will protest peacefully and then we will fight a legal battle. Their candidates, forced to run as independents, won more seats than any other party. But their leader remains behind bars, and some fear they may not be allowed to form government. They have stolen our mandate. We are going to have to get stay orders from the courts. Anger, too, from the Islamist party TLP. Its supporters joining the chorus condemning the voting irregularities. They also fear more vote tampering while the ballot count is delayed. Thursday's elections were marred by violence, a nationwide mobile phone shutdown and accusations of rigging. But the Commonwealth Election Observers Group is not ready to declare the poll unfair. For us to make a comment that elections are not transparent, we must be very sure of our facts. And we're still looking into this fact. Both Imran Khan and his main rival Nawaz Sharif claimed victory on Friday despite Sharif's party seat count way behind. The chair of Khan's party believes they can find coalition partners to form government. So we will decide in due course which party we are going to join and how we are going to proceeding. We trust every institution. We are just asking them to respect this mandate of the public. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Trust and hope in a time of upheaval and multiple challenges for a country of 241 million people. Meghna Bali, ABC News. A former military general accused of human rights abuses and the fatal kidnapping of activists is poised to become Indonesia's next president. 72-year-old Prabowo Subianto is the clear front-runner for the presidential election taking place on Wednesday. More than two decades on from his alleged crimes, the perennial candidate is riding a wave of youthful support as 200 million people prepare to vote. On a hot afternoon in the city of Semarang, Prabowo Subianto is working the crowds. No stranger to election rallies across this archipelago nation, Prabowo, as he's known, is in his fourth straight campaign. Almost every poll says that we're going to win in one round, but let's not be careless, let's not be complacent. This time around, he's reinvented himself to tone down the strongman image that failed to propel him to victory in past elections. Political elites in Jakarta often scold me for being rude when I talk. I'm a former soldier. This is just the way I am. I don't do sweet talk. I don't talk in circles. Straight talking, which seems to have won the support of many young voters this time around. Yeah, the guess. Prabowo is firm, honest, wise. Prabowo is extraordinary. He has diligently and consistently run for president, despite having failed a few times. 
Many weren't even born during the most infamous period of Prabowo Subianto's past. In 1998, as the regime of Indonesia's autocratic leader Suharto was crumbling, the special forces, then under Prabowo's command, kidnapped and tortured 22 activists. Nine survived and returned, 13 were never seen again. My son was very active. He didn't want to see injustice happening before his eyes. Payun's son Utok is among the 13 activists who were never found. Because it's been 25 years, I just want legal certainty on what happened and the whereabouts of my son. Prabowo Subianto has made comments over the years acknowledging involvement in the kidnappings of the nine who survived. He said circumstances were different and he was defending the nation. But he's now more dismissive. They accuse me of doing this and that, a coup plot, abducting activists, killing them, etc. Well, what can I say, huh? This is democracy. If people believe those accusations, simply don't vote for me. He's never admitted or been directly linked to the missing 13 and their presumed killings. He was, however, dishonorably sacked from the military for his tactics. Whatever happened back then, Prabowo should not be president. Once he's in that role, our search for answers will be over. There's no more hope to fight. Payan and the families of the other victims, for now, maintain their search for answers. Monthly protests outside the presidential palace calling for these decade-old cases to be properly investigated. Despite promises to address human rights cases, outgoing President Joko Widodo has made little progress in 10 years. Now his son Gibran is Prabowo Subianto's pick for vice president. The youthful running mate is helping recast the former soldier's image to a new generation with a cute and cuddly style. It's not position that I'm after, it's not rank that I seek. I just want to see the people prosper. If Prabowo Subianto can win at least 50% of the vote, then this tilt at the top job will be third time lucky for him. If his two rivals combined can prevent him winning a majority, then he'll have to go to a runoff in June. Prabowo and his team are desperate to avoid a longer campaign for a runoff poll. And they're increasingly confident they'll seal the victory in one go this week. Bill Bertles, ABC News, Semarang, Central Java. King Charles has thanked the public for its support in his first statement since being diagnosed with cancer. The 75-year-old monarch said, as all those who have been affected by cancer will know, such kind thoughts are the greatest comfort and encouragement. The king is staying at Sandringham while being treated for an unspecified form of the disease. His cancer was detected while undergoing treatment for an enlarged prostate in January. Billions of people around the world have gathered to ring in the Lunar New Year and usher in the Year of the Dragon. Revelers filled the streets of Hong Kong for parades and colourful dances, the first celebration since pandemic restrictions were lifted. In mainland China, travel numbers are expected to reach historic levels, with hopes the annual rush will give a boost to the economy. Lunar New Year festivities will continue for the next two weeks. Australian borrowers struggling with rising interest rates look set for some relief in 2024. But for those looking to get into the market, there's little to look forward to. As the ABC's Alan Collar explains, the affordability crisis is really starting to bite in cities you may not expect. You're probably aware that house prices went up again last year, even though interest rates kept rising as well. And you won't be surprised to learn, of course, that this made houses less affordable. The house price to income ratio kicked back up to 7.5. But there are a couple of things that might surprise you. Adelaide became the second least affordable Australian city last year. And despite rising prices and crushing interest rates, first home buyers were the fastest growing type of borrower. Here's affordability by city. Sydney's way out in front, of course, as the least affordable Australian city. It's one of the least affordable in the world. But Adelaide has just taken over from Hobart in second place. Hobart, I hear you say, and Adelaide? What about Melbourne? Well, this graph is dwelling value to local income. And the average income in each city is different. 
Adelaide's median house price is 7.9 times local average income. And when it comes to rent, Adelaide is actually number one, the worst place in the nation to be a tenant. What's going on? Well, put simply, incomes in Adelaide, Hobart and Brisbane are not keeping up with house prices, which are being pushed up by fast rising population and by first home buyers. Loans to them surged 21% last year to be the fastest growing category of buyer. They now represent almost 30% of borrowers. So what's going on with that? Well, that's simple too. The back of mum and dad coughing up early inheritances and politicians showering them with grants and concessions, desperate to appear to be doing something about affordability while actually making it worse. When my wife and I bought our first house in 1980, the average house price was 3.5 times average incomes. Now it's 7.5 times and rising. That didn't have to happen. It's Australia's worst economic mistake. Beekeepers in Western Australia are making honey while the trees blossom in what is predicted to be the last big harvest before the potential devastation of the industry. The huge haul of hundreds of kilos of Mary honey is bittersweet as farmers prepare for the arrival of the destructive Varroa mite. From the tallest of timbers to the smallest saplings, Mary trees are in full bloom across southern WA. Nice little dollop. The bumper blossom season is good news for beekeepers. It's, it's everywhere and, and pretty much every tree has got either something on or it's absolutely loaded with bud. The unique nectar is yielding several hundred kilos of honey a day. Looks good. Looks nice and full. But these producers fear it will be the last time they see a harvest this big before the imminent arrival of the destructive varroa mite. The pest was first detected in Australia in 2022. Nearly 50,000 hives were destroyed by the mite across New South Wales, and it's continuing to spread. It's a, it's a matter of when, not if. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to prepare our own businesses and, and look to the east coast and, and, you know, further abroad to New Zealand as to what life might look like for us. So 40 sentinel hives have been placed around the state to act as like an early warning system for the eventual incursion of the royal mite into WA. And certainly commercial beekeepers are on high alert, but authorities say the onus for monitoring hives also spreads to the hobbyists. People like me, one of 20,000 people who took up this fascinating hobby during or after COVID. The roles and the responsibilities of those recreational beekeepers are no different to any other beekeeper. Biosecurity responsibilities are paramount. Beekeepers banding together to protect this liquid gold for as long as possible. Anthony Pansier, ABC News, Pemberton. Time for sport with Tom Wildey and Tom. Glenn Maxwell has done it again. Yeah, he's produced another blistering century. Bree helping Australia set the West Indies a massive total in the second T20 International at Adelaide Oval. Maxwell produced some incredible shots as he blasted 120 off just 55 deliveries, including hitting eight sixes. His innings and 31 of 14 from Tim David saw Australia make 241 from its 20 overs. Nicholas Pooran got the West Indies off to a flyer in their chase, hitting Jason Berendorf for three consecutive sixes, but quick wickets slowed their chase, leaving them with work to do. Australia spinner Alana King says a feeling of excitement is sweeping through the camp ahead of the test match against South Africa at the Wacker Ground starting Thursday. It's the last match of the multi-format series between the two nations, with Australia winning the one-day and T20 formats. The women's teams play fewer test matches than their male counterparts, and King says they're embracing the opportunity. Excitement is probably the number one uh, word that is getting thrown around within our group, and, yeah, I think... We're, we're excited for what South Africa's got for us in the, the last game of this multi-format um, series. Fremantle defender Heath Chapman is in doubt for round one after suffering a hamstring injury during an intra-club match. Scans have revealed a moderate grade strain with the club unwilling to put a timeline on his return. The defender only played three games last season after suffering a series of leg and shoulder issues. He's only managed 26 matches since being drafted in 2020. 
Sporting history could be made tomorrow with Perth's Mitch Wisnowski bidding to become the first Australian to play in and win a Super Bowl. The West Australian punter will line up for the San Francisco 49ers against the Kansas City Chiefs in one of the glitziest NFL finales ever. Mitch Wisnowski has already made a splash in the NFL. And Wisnowski had to take it. He might get it. Wisnowski's going to run for the first down and more. But come tomorrow, the former Perth tradie may have etched his name into Australian sporting folklore. For the second time in four years, the 31-year-old punter for the San Francisco 49ers will take on the Kansas City Chiefs in the grandest show in American sports. And this time, he wants to leave with a history-making triumph. It would be cool to sort of, yeah, be the first Australian and, uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, inspire people back in Australia. He sold his house to move to Melbourne to fund um, his time in America initially, so credit to him for giving it everything that he had. Wisnowski's quest for immortality takes place on a Super Bowl stage like no other. Las Vegas hosts the 58th edition of the NFL's championship game with the Kansas City Chiefs looking to go back to back and win it for the third time in five years. Oh. Usher will be headlining the famous halftime show. But another musical megastar in Taylor Swift will garner most of the attention ahead of her Australian tour with her boyfriend Travis Kelsey looking for another Super Bowl victory with the Chiefs. We love to shine light on others, shine light around the people that, that, that help and support us. Um, and on top of that, we just I, I feel like we both have a, just a love for life. Just saw green but it's the 49ers and their Aussie punter who may just ruin that American fairy tale. Daniel Garb, ABC News. The Australian women's basketball team has qualified for the Paris Olympics with a 33-point win over Germany in Brazil. Opal's captain Tess Madgen led by example with 15 points and 6 rebounds. The 85 points to 52 victory and last Friday's win over Brazil meant the team booked its spot for Paris ahead of tomorrow's game against Serbia. After the match, Opal's great Lauren Jackson hinted at an international retirement and that she wouldn't be going to the Olympics. Laurie, congratulations. One more Olympic Games. Okay. Yes. No or oh, no? For us. No, no, no. Now I'm done. How exciting that I get to finish my national career with Australia in Brazil. So it's very special. 24. Qatar has won its second consecutive Men's Asian Cup after beating Jordan 3-1 in the final on home soil. Qatar went ahead from the penalty spot, but the Jordanians struck back midway through the second half. The Qataris would convert two more penalties after that, though, to claim the title, with Akram Afiz netting a hat-trick. The triumph is a strong response from Qatar after they struggled at their home World Cup in 2022. And Bree, that is the latest in sport. Thank you, Tom. Well, it was a tiny bit milder today, but still a pretty hot one for the city. Right now in town, it's 33 degrees and humidity is 27%. Perth's minimum was 18.7, around half past five this morning, rising to a top of 37.5 just after two o'clock this afternoon. The state's coolest spot was air with a minimum of five degrees. The state's highest maximum of 46 reached at Roeburn and Mandora. Cloud bubbling over the north and eastern interior is bringing an increasing number of showers and thunderstorms. On the synoptic, the southern section of a deep west coast heat trough is moving inland ahead of a new ridge developing on the southwest coast. That ridge will expand along the south coast tomorrow and across southern WA on Tuesday, pushing the west coast heat trough further inland. A new branch of the trough will then quickly form down the west coast from Tuesday onwards. Taking a quick look at the country's capitals tomorrow, sunny and mid to high 30s for Adelaide and Melbourne, cloud about for Hobart and Canberra, mostly sunny and 29 in Sydney, with showers and a possible storm set for Darwin. Back to WA and very hot over the inland southwest Kimberley and inland Pilbara, with showers and gusty thunderstorms over the Kimberley, northern parts of the interior and eastern Pilbara. Very hot conditions over the Gascoigne into the goldfields and northern parts of the South Westland Division, milder about southern parts. Light showers over southern coastal parts of the South Westland Division, windy about the southwest, extending east over southern parts of the state during the day. In Perth, sunny, a top of 35 tomorrow after an overnight low of 20. 
Sunrise will be at nine minutes to six, setting at ten past seven. And looking ahead, sunny and 35 for Tuesday, heating up to 39 for Thursday, down to 31 for Friday before it's set to heat up once again. And that's ABC News. Pamela Medlin will be back with you tomorrow. In the meantime, you can stay up to date with ABC News Online or you can catch up anytime on ABC iView. It's been a pleasure having your company. Take care and good night.